Onaka. Today is the 27th of April, 2022. Now is the opportunity, is the time to train our minds in samadhi, this quality of peace and collectedness. We place our left leg on top of our right, or our right leg on top of our left, our right hand on top of our left hand, or our left hand on top of our right hand. We set our bodies to be upright and straight and have mindfulness to set, establish mindfulness in front of us, to know the breath as it goes in, to know the breath as it goes out. And at this time, we put down all of our thoughts and proliferation about the past and future. At this time, it's the time to recollect the qualities of the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha, to recollect the good things that we've done in the past. And this gives rise to fullness and happiness of heart. We spread loving kindness to all beings. We wish ourselves to be well and happy, all beings to be well and happy, to be free from suffering, not to hurt or harm one another. So we set our mindfulness in this way, to have mindfulness with the in and out breath. On the in breath, boot. On the out breath, do. Or on the in breath, counting one, two, three, four, five. On the in breath, counting one, two, three, four, five. To have mindfulness with this. So this is training our mindfulness to be firm and well established for samadhi to be well established in order to give rise to wisdom. So now, at this time, we're going to practice samadhi to make our minds peaceful and collected, but we'll have questions and answers as well. So you can listen to these questions and answers, but as you listen, be aware of your breath as it goes in and out as well. Sometimes you may not understand the question or answer and that's fine, never mind about that. But set the mind to be still, to have mindfulness and collectedness. And this is correct. There's no need to know a lot, because this is correct Dhamma practice already. Kogaka. So the question is, when contemplating the four elements, is it a valid approach to discern the elements by corresponding sensations in the body? like weight or heaviness, lightness is earth, moisture is water, breath and movement is wind, temperature, heat and cold is fire, or should one mainly visualize the elements or both? Venerable Ajahn and unanswered that this is about mindfulness and contemplating the body. For instance, we can see the body as a skeleton it's composed of bones or the various small and large organs this is all the earth element. And whether seeing it as heavy or light, never mind about that, but see it all as earth element. We see the body degrade. We see the bones change. For instance, the bones start out as white, and then they decompose and become brown. They degrade even more and they become black. And they degrade even more and they become just like dirt. And so, when the bones become brown, we see them just like dirt, as it's all earth element. And so this earth element is characterized by the quality of hardness, like a tree, or a stone, or a pile of dirt, or a diamond, or mineral, various types of minerals, and so on. These are all earth element, characterized by hardness. And we separate them out into this element or that. But whether we see it as an image or not, either way is fine. But what we're doing is teaching the mind that this is the earth element. We're contemplating in that way. Similarly, the water is softness and fluidity. This is the quality of water. Fire is heat. And the air is the breath or that which occupies the empty spaces. This is something we can feel. And sometimes we see it as well. For instance, when the mind has more energy, we can see a nimitta or image in the mind. We can see the bones and contemplate them. And this is the mind that's gathered in samadhi. 
So the next question is, can devas attain stream entry? There are accounts in the suttas of devas becoming stream enterers. Venerable Adenanan answered that a deva, a heavenly being that realizes stream entry, the first stage of enlightenment, is a deva who's built parami a lot already as a human to develop, to come to the point where they can listen to the Dhamma of the Buddha. When the Buddha taught the first discourse, the Dhamma Chaka Pavatana Sutta, Venerable Anya Kondanya saw the Dhamma and realized stream entry. And at the same time, a great number of devas, many millions of devas, realized stream entry as well. Or for instance, the mother of the Lord Buddha listened to the Dhamma of the Buddha as a deva and realized stream entry. So therefore, devas can realize stream entry. And humans that realize stream entry develop their minds to become deva-like minds first. This means that they're, they bring their mind to the point of a deva, so their parami is ready. And then when they listen to the Dhamma, because their mind is ready, they can see the Dhamma. So we see that it's not different between humans and devas. It's in the mind. It's about the qualities in the mind, the parami, and when the mind is ready, then one sees the Dhamma. So the question is, what is the faith of an arahant? Or what is the faith of an arahant like? So then Arajan and Anand answered that this faith, this belief, in the beginning, it's belief in the quality of virtue in sila dhamma. We believe that we do goodness and we get goodness. We do something bad and we receive something bad. We believe that the fruits of karma truly exist. This is a firm belief. We have faith in the Buddha, Dhamma Sangha, that the Buddha awakened to the truth and that his teaching, the Dhamma teaching, truly leads to freedom from suffering. So we have faith in this, but we're not yet able to do it. We're only able to do generosity and giving to some degree. And we know that sila, that virtue, is good, but we do generosity sometimes, sometimes not. But we have belief that generosity is something good and meritorious. We're able to win over the kilesas in the heart sometimes. So this is faith and generosity and virtue. And then we cultivate further belief in virtue. And at this point, we're not able to practice virtue every day. Some days we can, some days not. Some days we have the five precepts, some days not. But we have this firm intent. And when the parami becomes greater, then we can take care of our virtue every single day to develop our sila more and more whether we go from the five precepts to the eight or to the 10 or 227 to lead the brahmacharya, the celibate life. And this brings our mind peace and collectedness to a degree because the body, the actions of body and speech are under control. But the mind is still hot and on fire with greed, aversion and delusion still. So then we try to practice and train because we're still suffering. So we try to meditate to make our minds peaceful and collected. We try to train, but we still have doubts arise because the mind is still busy and agitated and chaotic. When we have samadhi, then we feel at ease and relaxed. But when we don't have samadhi, then we feel agitated and chaotic but we still put forth effort in the practice. We try to do this continuously, then we're able to make the mind peaceful and collected, and our mind feels cool and at ease. At this point, we want to see the Dhamma, so we practice more. We practice to really train the mind, to uh, torture the mind, to train the heart, to bring the mind to stillness to see the body as a heap of elements, a heap of earth, air, fire, and water. 
we see the earth element degrade and disintegrate and become empty, then we're able to understand at this point. We understand that materiality, that the body is empty. This is the arising of wisdom. And at this point, our belief and faith increases even more because we've realized wisdom. And this wisdom comes through or by virtue of our faith. And it's a belief and faith that comes from wisdom according to the degree we've practiced. So this is the mind that still has some wavering. It's not completely stable, but we keep practicing to see clearly, to see the body as earth, air, fire, and water. And we see this and we have even more faith arise. The faith becomes more firm and the mind ceases to waver. This is the arising of collectedness and wisdom to an even higher degree. And when we keep practicing like this, in the end we see the Dhamma. Then we may ask, well, having seen the Dhamma already, what is that like? Our faith is firm because we've seen the truth for ourselves. We've seen our own minds. It's not from study, it's not from learning but it's the Buddha arising in our own hearts. This is the mind that's not wavering. This is the mind of a stream enterer, a Sotapanna, who's entered the stream to Nibbana. And the mind that develops even higher from this point has, this is the mind that has the Buddha full and complete in the mind already, has faith, has mindfulness and wisdom, has great mindfulness and great wisdom, maha sati and maha panya. The faith and mindfulness are, are full and balanced. All the qualities are, are complete and full for the mind to be able to understand clearly and to know the Dhamma. And having known the Dhamma in this way, one may ask, well, do we need faith anymore? Do we need mindfulness and wisdom? So one way to understand this is to compare it to traveling to an island. One needs a boat to go to that island. But having reached the island, having reached the goal, then all the faith and effort, perseverance, mindfulness, collectedness and wisdom that we use to get there, we don't need anymore. The boat and all the equipment on it, we don't need anymore. So the faith for an arahant, for a fully awakened being, is complete and full already, just like the boat. But the mind of an arahant is above the world, is above faith. And this faith and practice, and these qualities of mindfulness and samadhi, are full and complete. Mindfulness is complete. But this quality of faith is no longer necessary because the mind has all qualities in their fullness and completeness already. In the beginning, we have faith sometimes and sometimes not. We have faith, have effort, have mindfulness, and sometimes we don't have these qualities. We're lacking in effort, faith, and mindfulness. And when we're lacking in them, then suffering arises. And sometimes when our faith degrades or or goes away like that, then we have to pick up our faith and cultivate it again. For instance, by listening to the Dhamma, or by studying the suttas, and so on. Or we think of the good deeds and merit that we've done in the past. This brings our mind to have firmer faith and more faith. And some people don't walk the path of faith, but walk the path of wisdom. So they can use the wisdom to cure the suffering in their minds, and then this will give rise to faith all the same. And whatever the case, all practitioners cultivate generosity and goodness and have faith. So we cultivate this faith, it's something that we're able to do. And when we have this faith, then we're able to practice. So may you understand this and comprehend this point. May you have perseverance and effort in this practice.
So the Arahant is the one who has the highest faith, the most full and complete faith in the Dhamma of the Lord Buddha, because the Arahant is one who's known for themselves, known the truth for themselves, and therefore their faith doesn't waver, doesn't change. So the next question, I wish to ordain as a monk in order to reach the goal. What is the most important thing to remember, keep in mind, or develop? Venerable Ajahnanan answered that in the beginning, we wish to develop the brahmacharya, the celibate life. And this is the highest in Dhamma practice. I have generosity, I have virtue, and as a monastic one has time because one is a monastic and using or practicing the life of a monk or novice, one relies on the gifts of others so one doesn't have to proliferate about taking care of a livelihood in the world. So this is the way of life of a samana, of a renunciate. And one practices to pay back the debt of gratitude to the Lord Buddha by putting forth effort in the practice, cultivating metta, and practicing the Dhamma, meditating to make the mind higher, <coughs> to practice restraint, to have virtue, to have giving, to have effort, to have mindfulness, to look over and care for the mind, to have clear comprehension, to practice, to have humbleness, gentleness, to listen to the Dhamma, to have loving kindness and compassion for all beings. So may you practice this a lot, develop this a lot. This is the path to seeing the Dhamma. So the next question, for over two decades, whenever I meditate for retreats or have deeper meditation, I feel an intense dull pain and pressure in the center of my chest as if I am bound there. I feel a similar sensation to intense expressions of love when they are directed at me. I have an aversion to deep expressions of love partly because it triggers that same pain in the center of the chest. I do not have a negative relationship to this sensation, but sometimes it feels like I am stuck there and relaxing there as part of my work. What does Lumpur think about it? So. Renavad and Nan answered that one has to observe this and consider that there, this feeling of tightness or heaviness, there are two types of this. One type comes from tightness and stress. The second type comes from samadhi, from collectedness of mind. And this feeling of tightness or pressure from samadhi can arise in the the nose area, the face, or the chest. It's this feeling of firmness, or tightness, or heaviness. So this is the arising of samadhi, and it's a quality of sukha. This quality of piti is a feeling of coolness, a fullness of heart, a feeling of lightness. But the feeling of sukha is a feeling of heaviness, like a rock or a metal. The body with sukha feels very heavy, like a big boulder or pile of uh, metal. This is the mind that's firm and stable. And sometimes the body feels very big as well. And when one exits the state of samadhi, then the mind has a lot of energy. So this is to do with samadhi. And when the mind gathers like this, it can be in different places in the head or face nose area or chest, that's a feeling of firmness. So you have to see when this feeling of firmness or pressure arises, does the mind have strength and energy? If in the beginning one feels annoyed with it, one doesn't like it, but one has to see, does it have usefulness, does it have value? And with regard to the experience of tightness or stress that gives rise to the feeling of pressure, then in this case one has to relax. One can breathe deeply, breathing very deeply in and deeply out in order to relax. So now we'll continue meditating until 9 p.m. And from this time forward, we'll meditate until 9 p.m. every evening.